Next up, Ian Hamilton. He's a UX designer and accessibility specialist. Indeed, thank you. Yeah. So, as um, Celia said, I'm an independent designer and accessibility specialist, and this accessibility that I'm here to talk to you about today. So, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why accessibility is important and how it fits in with the UX. But first, I'm going to explain a little bit about what accessibility actually is. So when I'm talking about accessibility, I mean it in terms of an accessible hotel room or an accessible parking space, you know, specifically about disability. So to explain about accessibility, I'm first going to explain a little bit about what disability itself actually is. So to do that, I have this chap here to help me explain. Now I'm sure from looking at this photo, everyone in the room could have some kind of a guess about what this gentleman's disability is. So what the thing is that's actually causing him to be disabled. So you might be thinking, perhaps he has cerebral palsy. In which case, you have guessed correctly in that he does have cerebral palsy. However, cerebral palsy is not actually a disability. Cerebral palsy is a medical condition. It's a very important distinction to make. So what else then? You might be thinking about the fact that he is in a wheelchair. But a wheelchair is just like a pair of glasses, you know? It's a piece of assistive technology that allows him to go about his day. And he was going about his day just fine until he tried to meet his friends in that bar. And that's when he encountered the steps. And that's what disability is. It's stuff like those steps. It's when someone's medical condition encounters some kind of a barrier which results in difficulty performing a day-to-day -day task. And these kind of barriers, whether it's steps in front of a bar, whether it's a shelf that's too high, whether it's the red team versus green team in deathmatch, these kind of barriers are so often put there by another person. You know, someone designed it to be like that. Which is a bit of a heavy thing to get your head around that as designers, as developers, we actually cause people to be disabled. But there is, of course, the flip side to that, which is that by being aware of what kind of barriers can be present, we can remove those barriers, avoid those barriers, and actually prevent these disabling situations from occurring. And it's that process that's known as accessibility. And accessibility is important. It's really important for all kinds of reasons, but there's two in particular that I'm going to talk about today. The first one being the human benefit. So games aren't just kind of, you know, a diversion. What games actually represent is access to recreation, to culture, to socialising, which is things that, you know, we all take for granted. But if for any reason your access to those things in day-to-day -day life is restricted, then all of a sudden games can become a really, really powerful contributor to your quality of life. So that's the first reason, the human benefit. The other thing I want to talk about is a bit more mercenary, it's just cold, hard cash. Because the figures for disability are quite staggering, some of them. So the official government statistics in the USA range between 15 and 18% of the population have some kind of impairment. And of course that only covers what falls under traditional definitions, the traditional umbrella. There's other conditions as well that can come up against barriers in gameplay that fall outside of that. And they're the really common ones, like color blindness. Color blindness affects 8% of males, really, really common. Difficulty reading. That's something you don't really hear about because the stigma is attached to it. But actually, in the USA, the figure for difficulty reading is 14% of adults. So whichever way you look at this, you know, there's big, big numbers, which equates to big markets, which equates to money to be made and money to be lost. And actually, if you consider accessibility early in development, there's a great deal that you can do very easily and very cheaply, sometimes even completely for free. So balancing those two things, the size of the market, the cheap cost of development, that adds up to a strong business case to be answered as well. So that's a little bit about accessibility, what it is, why it's important. So next up, how is it relevant to UX? There's a very, very simple answer to that question, and it's right here. So whether your job title is UX, whether your job title is UR, the U stands for users. What it doesn't stand for is some subset of users who happen to not have some kind of impairment. So it's actually written into our job titles. 
And what's involved with it is understanding your audience, using that understanding to remove barriers to their enjoyment of a game, you know, removing those things that stop people from experiencing the vision that the designer intends. Which, for anyone working in UX and games, sounds pretty familiar, right? So it is literally what we do on our day-to-day -day jobs anyway. It's just a case of that extra bit of audience understanding. So all, these, um, all disciplines, it's important stuff to know about, but particularly for us. And there's a couple of different ways that we can make a really, really strong difference as well. So these three things. First off, data. So recording, measuring, getting evidence. So basically that means tracking feature usage. There are some complications with tracking feature usage. There's only really one feature where you can get clean data. So basically being able to say, this feature is used only by people with his impairment, and they would not have bought the game without that feature, so you can relate it to a sale. There's only really one thing you can do that with, which is blindness, because you can actually track the technology that blind people use to access hardware with, and you know that they would not be playing the game if that technology wasn't there. And through tracking that data, you see some really interesting stuff. So, for example, there was a game called Mudrammer. Um, they spent two days making their game blind accessible and as a result found that 14% of their players are blind, which is way, way more than the percentage of the population who are blind. So they made an instant profit on that two days' work. Another example, a game called Solara. This is quite a visual iOS strategy game, so it took them longer, it took them a couple of weeks to do the work. What they saw was that their blind players played for much longer, and because it's a free-to-play game, that meant that they spent much, much more on in-app purchases. So they're blind players, this morning's demographic, were their highest value players. And both of those examples, they both speak to the same kind of thing, which is the power of managing to reach underserved audiences. Now, like I said, it's difficult to get that kind of clean data for other features, but to be honest, that doesn't really matter. You know, if you track data on how many people in your game play with subtitles turned on, how many people configure their controls, now, that gives you evidence that those features, regardless of who's using them and for what reasons, that those features are useful, that they're worth including in future games, and that they're worth spending decent time on to do well. So next up is playtesting, and specifically recruitment for playtesting. So including people with various different impairments in your recruitment profiles. So that can seem like a bit of an intimidating thing to take on, starting with, I mean, who do you recruit? And this is often the pitch that pops into people's heads when they think about disability. But actually, if you think back to the guy in the wheelchair at the start, this is a list of medical conditions. It's not really what's important. So if you take, for example, arthritis and essential tremor, those are two medical conditions that have absolutely nothing in common with each other medically. But they come up against the same barrier, which is small, fiddly interface elements. So address that barrier, you address both those conditions. Not only those conditions, but other ones. You know, stuff like cerebral palsy, dyspraxia, loads of different motor impairments. If you address the same barrier, or small fiddly interface elements, you've also addressed a whole load of vision impairments as well. and made the game better for so many different people. So you don't really need to worry so much about trying to represent all kinds of different, different impairments in your testing. Really, it just comes down to these four broad groups. And this is the World Health Organization's categorization of disability. So it's barriers relating to people's ability to see, ability to hear, cognitive function, which is the ability to take in and process information, and motor, which in terms of gaming, basically means ability to operate a controller. There is another group as well. It isn't really relevant to most games, but if you are developing a game that's relying on communication, multiplayer, it's also worth considering speech as well. So if at the various points that you're carrying out your user research, your testing, if you can just get some kind of representation from these kind of groups, then you will learn loads of really, really good stuff and be able to improve your game. And last is expert review. So whether that is giving you know, casual advice in a design review, whether it's going into full heuristics, just having some kind of knowledge and expertise about what kind of barriers there are, what kind of solutions there are, to be able to give good advice to your designers. 
So I'm going to give you a few examples now of those kind of barriers and solutions. Um, we haven't got much time, so it's not going to be comprehensive, but I will give you a resource at the end which has got loads more examples that you can learn about. I'm going to start with vision. So the first thing that often people think about when it comes to vision is blindness, right? And accessibility for blindness in gaming is actually a thing. There's even um, a couple of big name AAA titles, Killer Instinct, Mortal Kombat X, where the development team have actually gone to big efforts to make their games accessible to people who are completely blind. There's tournament level players of those games. But there are some quite big restrictions on what's possible. Some of it is technological because of the engines, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on it. If you want to know about blindness, ask me afterwards. I'll talk to you as much as you want about it. But for now, I'm going to focus on something else. Because actually, most people who've got impaired vision aren't blind. And even, not everyone knows this, but most people who are legally blind still actually have some degree of residual vision left as well. And there's all kinds of reasons why people have impaired vision, all kinds of different effects on people's vision. So everything from astigmatism to cataracts to glaucoma. But again, they all come up against the same kind of barriers, which is size and contrast. And this is an example. So this is a game called Epic Eric, and this is a mobile game. And this is a perfect example of what not to do. So here, I know the guy I developed this. He loves that I go around telling people his game is what not to do. But anyway, so um, as I said, this is a mobile screen. So you can imagine by the time this is scaled down to you know four inches, everything's going to be pretty tiny, pretty difficult to make out. Also, the contrast as well, because the mechanic of this game is based on swinging between those cogs. So it's quite difficult to work out normally by the time you add in even a moderate, mild to moderate level of vision impairment, it gets a whole lot harder again. And this kind of thing should look familiar. I mean, even if you don't have any kind of permanent impairment yourself, this is what it looks like playing in direct sunlight. And you see that a lot with accessibility, that it's not just about these permanent physical conditions. There's also temporary and situational impairments as well. For example, as well as direct sunlight, someone might be playing on a smaller screen than other people, that kind of thing. So anyway, this was early in development. Um, the developer realized that this was an issue. So by the time the game launched, it ended up like this. So you can see, quite simply, everything is larger, clearer, and particularly, the things that are interactive are really easy to distinguish from the things that aren't. And he actually took it a step further as well and implemented this. So, if you have a look at the top right, basically, all he did was slap a rectangle in between the foreground and the background, and allow that rectangle to be tinted all the way to white, all the way to back, so people can customize the level of contrast. And that took him one hour to implement, and most of the hour was spent on trying to get that slider working. But this kind of stuff, you know, high contrast modes, there are a few games that do this kind of stuff, but that really is the pinnacle. Even if you just aim for this, you know, make sure everything is decent size, decent contrast, and many, many more people are going to be able to have an enjoyable experience with your game. So, next up, hearing, subtitles. There's many, many reasons why people use subtitles. Obviously, absolutely critical if you're deaf. Also used by people because audio mixes and gameplay are unpredictable. Also because English isn't your first language and you find different accents difficult to understand. Also because you have a young baby and the only chance you get to play a game is when the baby's asleep and you don't want to wake them up. So all these different reasons why subtitles are used. So it's not really surprising to see data like this. So I have to give a bit of a disclaimer. This, was, this isn't by any means scientific. This was just kind of a straw poll of 500 people on the CNET website. But it starts to paint a picture. And considering that subtitles are used for so many reasons by so many people, it's obviously worth doing a good job on them. So it's quite a shame that people don't ever. Games have terrible, terrible subtitles. And I am talking about your games. And this isn't just coming from me as well, so please don't throw anything. This is coming from gamers. So this is a few quotes from a single NeoGAF thread. So you can get the general idea, right? People generally aren't very happy with the quality of subtitles in games. 
And the thing is, you can see the kind of things that people are complaining about. It's not rocket science, you know? Just wanting subtitles to be decent size, decent contrast, decent number of words per line. You know, this kind of stuff just isn't really difficult to do. So this is an example of the kind of thing that you're aiming for. So you can see the text is mixed case rather than full capitals. It's a large, clear typeface. And it's really clearly distinguished from the background. Now, there's a reason why I said this is what you're looking at as a base level, because actually there's a few different use cases for subtitles. So you've got people who are deaf, who want them to be as large and bold and clear as possible, because they need to understand every single word and not miss anything. And also you need it to indicate who's speaking, stuff like that. Then at the other end of the scale, you've got people who might just have subtitles turned on because they have tinny speakers. And they might, you know, every five minutes glance down to see a word that they happen to miss. And those people want subtitles to be small and unobtrusive so they don't distract from the gameplay. So actually, each one of these three options is the preferred option for a certain group of people. So, which one do you choose? Well, the thing is, we work in a digital medium. You don't need to choose. You can let people choose themselves. And this is something that's standard in other industries. You know, if you look at YouTube, you look at Netflix, they offer options for people to choose how they want the subtitle to be displayed. Hardly ever done in games. There have recently been a couple of examples. So this is from the latest Walking Dead, Michonne. You can choose what size you want your subtitles to be. This is from Life is Strange. Good example here about text contrast. But you can see here, you've got a choice of how big you want your subtitles. Also, you have a choice, it says there, semi-opaque overlay, that's referring to letterboxing, which is the black rectangle around the text. It's called letterboxing. As far as I'm aware, Life is Strange is the only ever game to have included that option. So if you really want to be at the pinnacle of innovation in gaming, just turn that black box on and off. You make a lot of people happy. There's all kinds of other things you can do as well, because these kind of problems They've already been solved in other industries. You know, people working in TV and film, there's really, really good guidelines and rules about how to do subtitles. Like the exact no optimal number of characters to have in the line, how to handle line breaks, all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to go into all of them today, but this address, if you have a look at this, this has got a whole bunch of tips on, like I said, these lessons from other industries about how to do a really good job of subtitles. So I'd really, really recommend checking this out. Got it? Great. Cool. So, moving on from hearing, we have motor. Um, so motor, like I said, the ability to operate a controller. So obviously some of that is down to physical. Also you have temporary impairments, such as having broken your wrist. You also have situational impairments. You might, for example, be holding on with one hand to a rail on a subway, or you might be holding on to a beer. So all these different reasons that can put restrictions on your ability to operate a controller. Now, I've got an example of one of the um, permanent reasons. So this is a chap who had a stroke at the age of 17. And he lost full control over the right-hand side of his body. But of course, he had no interest in giving up gaming. And he still plays using a regular controller. So we're getting a bit closer. You can see what he does. Basically, he takes the controller and wedges it underneath his arm. So by moving the entire controller around, he can operate the right stick. He then uses his thumb for the left stick that leaves him a couple of fingers free to operate buttons. So he can play pretty well with the regular controller. He just doesn't quite have the reach to reach all the buttons. So what to do? There's two solutions. One is avoiding unnecessary complexity. So now if it is really critical to your game that every single button on the controller needs to be used all the time, that's OK. But just think, is that really necessary? You know, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And the other side of it is offering some flexibility. You know, so if he had some way to move the important commands to locations on the controller that he could more easily operate them from, which is done through this, button mapping. So button mapping, again, obviously really popular for loads of people for loads of reasons, often because the player just doesn't agree with what the designer thought was a great control scheme. But for people like this guy, this can be absolutely critical. This can be a difference between being able to play and not being able to play. And obviously, this is talking about controllers. The same thing kind of translates across into mobile as well. And it's really, really easy if you're developing for mobile devices to fall into the trap of thinking, if someone's got a mobile device, 
they obviously must be able to do all the mobile-y kind of things, right? Which is not really the case. So for example, this guy, this is a common setup. You can see he has his tablet mounted in a fixed position. So he can do pretty much everything on that device apart from operate the gyroscope. Well, taking it a step further, this is a guy using a head pointer. So he's basically got a stylus mounted to his head. So again, there's loads of stuff he can do with his device. And it's really, really important empowering device for him. But he's not going to be doing many simultaneous multi-touch gestures. So again, avoid unnecessary complexity. Keyword is unnecessary. So if it really is essential you have all five fingers on the screen at the time, that's OK. But just think carefully, is that really necessary? The other side of it, again, as with remapping, is flexibility. This is what flexibility looks like on mobile. So this is from uh, Need for Speed on mobile. Um, you can basically see the gray rectangles there are the areas in which you can operate it. So for steering, swiping left and right, you can do that anywhere in the entire left-hand side of the screen. So the reason why the developers put this functionality in um, is because they're based in Melbourne, and there's a tram system in Melbourne which is very, very busy and overcrowded. And they basically wanted people to be able to play the game regardless of what cramped up position they're squeezed into on the tram. But that kind of flexibility is also really, really valuable for people who've got other physical reasons for not being able to operate controllers in the traditional way. So for example, one guy I spoke to last year, um, he loves games. He hasn't got the hand strength to operate a controller. All he can do is a touch screen. However, he has to lie on his back. The only way he can hold a tablet is by lying on his back propping it on his stomach and holding it by the top corners. So because this game allows you to control it along the top edge of the screen, he can play. This is one of the few games that he can play, one of the few avenues for recreation he's got. So this game is not exaggeration at all to say this game is life-changing for him. And there's another kind of flexibility as well on mobile. So actually on, on other platforms as well. So to illustrate this, I've got a game called Into the Dead. Is anyone familiar with Into the Dead? Yes, good stuff. So Into the Dead, it's basically an endless runner running into the screen through a field of zombies who are trying to eat you. And you have to dodge in between them. Simple controls, just left and right. And this is the control settings you see when you open the game. Now for most of development, the only control option there was was the option on the left the tilt controls. Now, the other options had been considered, but the designers, obviously the designers know what's fun. They knew that the tilt was the most fun option, so the other was discounted. But actually, right at the end of the development, the user researcher managed to persuade the rest of the team to include these other options specifically for accessibility, for people who can't physically operate the gyroscope. So the rest of the team, right, okay, fair enough. I guess that's kind of an altruistic thing to do. You know, we'll, we'll help out these people. They put the options in. But where it really got interesting was when they tracked the data. Because obviously they're expecting the first option is the fun one. That's what everyone's going to choose to use unless they really, really can't. And when they tracked the data, the data they got back was 25%, 25%, 25, 25. Equal across all of them. So by doing what they thought was you know, this altruistic gesture to reach this tiny percentage of their audience, actually what they'd done was improve the game for 75% of their players. So I think it's a nice example to, uh, to end up on. Um, that's all the ones I can talk about today. However, there is a resource. This is gameaccessibilityguidelines.com, and this has loads more of these kind of examples. I'll give you the address for it on the next slide. So there is actually one last thing that I want to buy you before I finish, which is a bit of audience participation, because I know how much everybody loves that. So it's not going to be painful, I promise. Um, I would just like to see a show of hands for how many of you are planning on giving up gaming by the time you reach the age of 65. No. There we go. I told you it wasn't going to be painful. So the reason I'm asking that is because actually those stats I was talking about at the start, those official government stats, that 15 to 18%, over the age of 65, that's 50%. So that's another really, really powerful reason to consider this. Not just because of the human benefit, the business benefit, because actually we're putting design principles in place now that will allow all of us to continue playing as we get older. Thank you. So, do we have time for any questions? Yeah? Maybe one or two. Okay. So, um, also, my contact details are there. 
please, please, please get in touch with me. I'm always happy to talk. And also, take a look at the thing down the bottom as well next week. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Very Pleasure. insightful. I wanted to know if and how people find games that have certain like accessibility features. Um, I, it seems like you've shown us you know, a whole bunch of them, but if I had a disability, how would I go about searching through thousands and thousands of games for this? Is there uh, a, a way to find yep. out? Very good question. So the question is about, is there, is there a way to, for people to find games that got accessibility features suited to them? That's a big, big problem. So, so often people just have to go out and try and error, go and spend all the money again. People who might have limited incomes as well, the hope it might work for them. There are a couple of ways around it. So there's um, specialist review sites. Um, so is Josh around? Yep. So Josh at the back here runs one of them called um, Dega System. Um, there's, there's a few websites that do specialist reviews. Um, what would be really, really nice to see, though, is actually seeing um, the uh, place where people buy games providing that kind of information. So there's two examples. Um, Steam. Um, actually, there was a campaign um, by a woman changed the org petition to try and, she's deaf, to try and get Steam to put information up about which games have subtitles. And that was only running for a couple of weeks, and they just shoved it straight in. So you can filter the game listings now. They're easy. And itch, um, itch.io, they've just started doing the same thing as well. But they do a much broader range of features. So whether a game is colorblind safe, whether a game's got remapping, that kind of stuff, that would be really, really nice to see you know, Steam, um, the iTunes store, all that kind of stuff, offering that kind of functionality. That would be amazing. Can you squeeze in, squeeze in one quick one? Sure. So your point is that in designing for accessibility, which uh, often we're talking about designing for minority populations, a smaller group of gamers, not the casual gamer, which makes the bulk of a lot of uh, our, our game population, or the core gamer that provides a lot of impetus for the design in the first mm -hmm. place. But we are saying that there's a marginal utility in providing a greater capacity for the control environment, for the ability for the average gamer also to receive extended feedback, to, exceed, to uh, experience the game in a way that, that wasn't originally designed as well. But then it has a bleed over in helping unique population groups have an opportunity just to experience the same thing that we're trying to design for everyone. So there's quite, a, quite an interesting presentation there. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, is this is kind of similar to the first question about uh, finding games with accessibility options. Yep. Um, let's say, like for my parents, for instance, who are older, who don't really know that those uh, options exist because the default aren't normally those options. How do you suggest developers should um, uh, guide them towards finding those options and how to set them on. Yes, excellent question. Can, can yep. you just like answer? For yeah, sure? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, very, very good question. So the question is about how do, you, um, how do you communicate to games about the features that you've actually got in your game, right? Yes. Yeah. So I can give you a couple of good examples of that. There's two games which I'm sure a few people will be familiar with, which is um, Dots and Flow Free. So they're both iOS games based on connecting dots of the same color which presents obvious problems for color blindness. So um, there was an endless stream of complaints on Twitter from colorblind people saying, I can't play your game. Actually, both those games had colorblind modes in them. People just weren't thinking to navigate through the settings to find them. So really, really important to let people know about this stuff. Let people know on feature listings in your press kit. You know, get yourself a bit of extra SEO juice for people searching this stuff on Google. Talk about that feature listings on um, storefronts. Talk about it in games itself. So as part of the tutorial, you know, you ask, or do you ask people if you want to invert the controls? Why not ask them if they want to remap the controls as well? You know? Also, something really, really useful is loading screen hints. So for example, in Battlefield Hardline, one of the loading screen hints says, if you're having trouble seeing the enemy team, check out the colorblind modes in the settings. So all that kind of stuff, really, really important. Because I mean, that's the last thing you want to do, is spend time and money developing this kind of stuff, and it goes to waste because people don't know you've done it, right? So yeah, very good question. We get? Yeah, time for more things to go on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Project. <laughs> yes, yes. So the question is how does this relate to VR and AR, which is an other excellent question. So a lot of this stuff just kind of applies directly to it, you know, like color blindness doesn't make any difference whether you're in VR or not. 
there are some things that are unique to VR. First off, simulation sickness isn't unique to VR, but it's more prevalent in VR. Um, and that's something that a lot of people are putting a lot of work into. You know, Oculus has got good guidelines about it. That's something I'd really, really hope, though, is that people who learn about this stuff in VR apply it to other games, because it's just as relevant in other first-person, third-person games. So, so common for people to be locked out of games. And actually, as I've got older, I've started to get it as well. So Alien Isolation was the first game I couldn't play. I, was, I really wanted to play it. I was gutted. But anyway, yeah, so simulation sickness. Um, another one, subtitles. So subtitles, even though the presentation isn't great, standard feature across pretty much all games, not in VR. So subtitles have started to disappear from VR games. It's because there isn't just the neat, obvious solution of putting the subtitles across the bottom of the screen. So designers are like, hmm, ah, so that we just won't put subtitles in. Not great for people who are deaf, right? So there's solutions. There's a couple of options. One is that you can just have them floating in front of you. Not so great because you have to keep focus switching in between the foreground and the background. Not great. Another option is to just attach them to the source of the audio, like speech bubbles. Again, not so great because if someone's speaking behind you, you have no idea and you miss out. So there was actually a really nice example, um, prototype that is an Australian developer is putting together, which basically merges the two. So they're attached to the audio source, apart from when they're off screen, at which point they stick to the side of the screen that the audio is coming from, so you know to turn around. Really nice. And I'd hope, it's the same kind of thing that, um, right, on top of it is right, the same kind of thing in Paragon. They got some interface stuff in there for when um, the uh, health bar of the base is out of view, then it'll snap around, same principle. So I'd hope that once developers actually start to implement that kind of solution, then everyone else will just kind of copy them. Yeah. Uh, how do you mean by improvements? Ah, no, definitely not. No, because um, if you have um, low vision, there's a really, really easy workaround, which is to sit closer to the screen. You can't do that in VR. So you have to be really careful. I've seen a lot of really tiny interfaces in VR as well, so it's definitely worth paying attention to. Yeah, that especially. Epilepsy as well. There, there hasn't been any research on epilepsy in VR, but um, a big factor in a seizure being triggered is how much of your field of view is taken up by a flickery effect. And in VR, that can be 100%. So something else that's worth paying attention to as well. But yes, there's the, there are those few things that are specific to VR. So that's a very, very good question. Cool. That's it. Thank you.